I'm not sure if I'm proud that I feed the cats, but the cats are happy that I do it. <laughs> uh, somebody contacted me um, a couple months ago and said uh, they liked a song that I had written, and they wanted to put it in a book for children. So this would be a way of learning uh, the five precepts. And the book is coming out within the next month. So I brought my ukulele, and I'm going to sing the song so you don't have to buy the book. <laughs> and it's, it's called the Five Precept Song. So the title of the talk is, It's Always the First Time. And I didn't really know what that meant when I first saw about it. I, what I wanted to do was sort of investigate what the first time was. And why does it never seem like the first time? It seems like the old times or the new times. We get used to things. So, past. The past is something that I find can be troubling, it can be refreshing, but it's never real. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but um, occasionally I'll wake up about 3 in the morning, and I'm thinking of something that happened 14 years ago, and I wish I hadn't said it that way, and then I struggle to go back to sleep. And I'm thinking to myself, this stuff doesn't die and go away. It just lingers, waiting for the right moment to appear. I have been in the process of having many memorial services for all the people I used to be and all the thoughts that I have. <laughs> I need to put them to rest. I need to understand that there's nothing I can do about something that happened 14 years ago. It shaped me in some way, but it doesn't have to define me. What I need to do is focus on what I'm doing now. And one of my favorite teachers, Ram Das, used to say, be here now. I struggle with how to be here now, because the past and the future are so inviting. The past is something that we can edit <coughs> as we rethink about the situations we found ourselves in. The future is something we can hope will be better. Hope will have more to do, more to think, more happiness, more peace. All the things that we're missing right now could happen in the future. So how to get to now? How to make it the first time? How to bring back the joy and the mystery of life? So. It really starts with the five precepts. That little song that I just sang to you is about changing your karma. Your karma is everything you think, everything you say, everything you do. 
what you think, say, and do transforms energy. And it's given a moral value. Skillful, unskillful, good, bad. The least amount of karma is created by what we think. The consequences of what we think, until they manifest in speech and action, really don't affect us very much. They affect us internally, but externally, people generally don't know what we're thinking. And if we don't turn it into speech and action, we can just keep going. But once that thought turns into speech, it has global ramifications. Global because all things are interconnected and interdependent. You can't do anything that doesn't affect everything else. Action has the most value and the most consequence. So we need to really be aware of what we say and do. And those five simple precepts get us focused on what we're doing and what we're saying. So number one, not to take life. How easy could that, should that be? And yet we're faced with the challenges of living in a very complicated community. And we may not go out and kill humans or lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> but when it comes to spiders and cockroaches, ants and flies, we don't give it a second thought. That life is insignificant. It's not very long and it's irritating <laughs> to us because they're in our space. We pay rent, we have a mortgage. This is our space. We didn't invite them. And the easiest way to ask them to leave is to kill them. So the Buddhists would say, well, maybe I should spend more time not killing and supporting life. Maybe I should see if there's an alternative. Maybe I should see if there's a workaround to killing all these ants and spiders and cockroaches. And given enough thought and having enough time, you will come up with an alternative to death. But it takes time and it takes the urgency of not wanting to take a life. Not taking, not taking what is not given. This is difficult in America because a lot of Americans have given up their citizenship and they have become consumers. And we're really good at consuming and producing. Though the producing now is often done overseas, but we consume like crazy with all the sales. And we all have so much stuff and each time we buy new stuff, they give us a receipt. Ownership has been transferred. Look at all the stuff I own. And this stuff can drive you nuts. Because if you have too much stuff, then you think about a storage locker. <laughs> or a bigger house. Or maybe two houses. It never stops. One of the things I have found with being a monastic is living in a room and having a limited amount of space. And people are very kind to me and they want to show their kindness by giving me stuff. And I have come to the point where I say to them, I don't have any more room. I'll accept your gift, but I'm going to have to pass it on to somebody else. I'm going to have to re-gift it because my room is full. Now each year I throw more and more stuff away. Because I realize if I haven't touched it or looked at it for five or six years, maybe I don't need it. And, and so I'm slowly getting rid of my stuff and I'm slowly finding my personal freedom through letting go. Letting go is a good thing. Number three, loving kindness, no sexual misconduct. You know, this fascinates me because I've been celibate now for 22 years. And so far, so good. <laughs> and, and people actually thank me for not having children. They say, well, we have enough. We've got seven billion. Everybody else is doing a really good job. We're glad you're not. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, yeah, you know, we have this driving force. Nature gave it to us that we want to replicate. And any moment of the day, we are ready to replicate. And if you watch some of these old cowboy movies and they're having wars and they're fighting and the cattle barons and stuff, 
the most inopportune times, they seem to fall in love and want to replicate. And I'm thinking, why would you want to do it now? <laughs> but as it turns out, now is always the best time. <laughs> Number four, speaking skillfully. The Buddha said, harsh speech, malicious speech, gossip, idle chatter, false speech, those are wrong kinds of speech. The reason they're wrong is because they increase suffering rather than decrease suffering. So can we speak skillfully? Can we speak with encouragement? And can we sound like we understand the situation and have some soft, kind words to share with them? Can we do that? And yes, we can. Do we need to have a comment for everything? Actually, we don't. Noble silence is a really good thing. <laughs> And over this past year, because it's been an election year, noble silence has not been practiced. <laughs> so in my life, I try to say less, and, and in saying less, I try to say more. And it's challenging. Number five, this is a tough one. You know, we just had this pass at the election. It is now the new year. Guess what? It's now okay to get high in another way. You know what I'm saying? As if we don't have enough ways to get high, now it's legal to get high through marijuana. And the Buddhist would say, getting high really restricts your wisdom. It makes you sort of stupid and dumb. You end up doing things you shouldn't have done, creating so much more suffering in the world. If only you had been sober you would have realized through your kindness and your clarity that this is a really stupid thing to do or say. So we try to avoid getting high. Though I must say, I have a weakness when it comes to hostess cupcakes. <laughs> and you just get a little high from those. It's not too bad. The clarity and kindness is still there. Those five things allow us to be now. Because what we say and what we do happens now. It doesn't happen in the future. It doesn't happen in the past. It happens right now. So if you want to see something for the first time, every time, those five precepts, those five precepts get you started. They get you in that direction. Now the mind, oh, the mind. We can pretty much react and respond and monitor what we say and do, but what we think. You know, this is really a difficult situation. A man much wiser than I said, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to be true. So how do you get the mind to be in the present moment? What's necessary? And why is that a good thing? You know, for 20 plus years, I rode a motorcycle. And one of the things they said about riding a motorcycle is you can't look at road hazards. So say you're riding your motorcycle and up ahead is a tire that has miraculously come off a truck. And it's lying like a big serpent in the middle of your lane. If your eyes look at that tire, you run right into it because you drive or ride in the direction you're looking. It works the same way with the past. If you are focused on something you did 14 years ago, you're going to run right into it. The idea in riding a motorcycle is to visualize your exit. Look at where you want to go, not what you want to avoid. And that's sort of how it works with the mind. Look at where you want to go, not where you've been. So, in watching your breath, the sensation of breath, which is often recommended in meditation, what you find is the sensation of breath is always happening right now. Every physical sensation we have is always happening right now. Do you remember when you were small and you couldn't believe it and your parents or friends said, well, pinch yourself to see if it's real. And that pinch brought you into the present moment experience of your life. And watching the sensation of breath 
brings you in to the present moment experience of your life. So last night at the meditation center, we celebrated the new year by meditating for three hours. It started at nine o'clock and people gathered and we sat and meditated, we took a break, we meditated, we took a break, we meditated, we took a break, we did some chanting, we had some blessings, and then we had tea and cookies. Probably the best part for most people of last night. <laughs> In that moment of three hours of watching the breath, you sort of come to this place of this is what's happening now. This is how it feels to be present. This is where I build my future. I need to do it now. Everything I do now will affect something in the future. The future, though, never happens. When we get to the future, it tends to be now. So if I'm going to the store tomorrow, I'm writing my list now. I'm driving to the store tomorrow now. I'm entering the store now. I'm buying all my stuff now. I go to the counter, I have 40 cans of cat food and two boxes of Hostess cupcakes. <laughs> and the clerk behind the counter says, are you single? <laughs> I'd say, yes, I am. <laughs> Me and the cats. But everything I did to plan my trip to the store, I did now. Every time I think about my future, I'm doing it now. When I'm planning for my future, I'm doing it now. So I never get into the future. And I'm always editing the past. I'm always making it either better or worse, depending on how I feel that day. And in the present moment, I have a shot. I have a shot at perfection. I can make this moment perfect. Now you say, well, listen, we just went to 2016, and it's the, one of the worst years we've ever been through, according to some people. And there was no perfection at all in 2016. And I would have to say, no, no, every moment in 2016 was perfect. It was just the way it was supposed to be. And you go, no, it couldn't. That can't be the way it's supposed to be. But you know what? It couldn't have been any other way. All the conditions necessary for that moment to occur were there. It couldn't have occurred any other way. So how can you see the perfection in a moment when you don't like that moment? when you know it could be better, when you know it should be better. Well, one of the reasons we can't see the perfection in the present moment is because of us. We have the three poisons, according to Buddhism, that prevents us from seeing the perfection in the moment. The three poisons are greed, hatred, and delusion. Our reality our present moment experience is filtered through those three poisons. So we look at the world and say, it is a terrible place to live. And yet, it's the only place we have to live. And we've tried to change the world ever since we figured out we weren't the world, we were separate from it. And we never succeeded. I would say the world is probably worse now than it has been in the last couple hundred years. We have more people, we have more poverty, we have more starvation, we have more homelessness, and yet somehow, because of all the conditions, that is the way it's supposed to be. So as a Buddhist, what's a Buddhist to do? What is a Buddhist to do? If a Buddhist can't change the world, can't make it perfect, can't even be here now, <coughs> What are we supposed to do? Well, it turns out that we have a lot that we can do. But it's nothing to do with changing the world. There was a man who was fasting for 10 days. And he was so excited about the challenge of fasting, he was going to purify himself. And then there's another man who had no money and hadn't eaten in 10 days. Now, both those men were experiencing the same feelings of hunger. But one wasn't feeling desperation. One was feeling confident 
in the fact that what he was doing would make a positive difference in his life. And the one who was starving was thinking about all the things he could have or should have done to get the money necessary to have some food. And the Buddhist would look at both those guys and say, ah, the one who's fasting is fine. He's doing exactly what he wants to do. But the one that's starving is not so good. Maybe I can find some food for him. Not because I want to change him, but because I want to reduce his suffering. I don't want him to suffer because he lacks food. Okay. All of a sudden, the little cat comes in the backyard. And then another one. And then another one, and they're scrawny, and they haven't eaten. And I say to myself, wow, I can't save them. You know? But maybe I can just feed them. Maybe I can get rid of that hunger. Get rid of the little suffering they have because they haven't eaten in a couple weeks. Well, as you all know, when you feed a cat, they never leave. <laughs> So years go by, and each morning and each evening I go out and I feed the cats. Not because it's the right thing to do, but because I'm reducing their suffering. And they never say thank you. <laughs> and in not saying thank you, I realize I'm doing it in an ultimate way. As an expression of kindness. Not of love. I, I don't like the word love, I, I, I must say. And the reason I don't like the word love, it's controlling, it's a, it's a giant form of attachment. There's all sorts of things wrong with love, but everything is right about kindness. And in Buddhism, we have loving kindness. We connect those two words. They temper each other. So I'm being kind to all those little creatures in the backyard because I want to reduce their suffering. And I'm slowly, through meditation and the five precepts, transforming my greed into generosity, my hatred and anger into love and kindness, and most important, my delusion into wisdom and insight. Now the two wings of the Buddhist bird are compassion and wisdom. Compassion comes through meditation. Compassion comes through annihilating the wrong view of self, not killing it, but annihilating its hold over you. It no longer is your master, it has become your tool. And you use the process of self to reduce the suffering in the world. And when you don't stand independently apart, you are interconnected and interdependent. And you realize that that little cat who's hungry there is a part of you now that's hungry. And that person who is homeless, there is now a part of you that's homeless. <coughs> so the compassion comes out of realizing, through your personal experience, the interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena. Interconnectedness, interdependence of all phenomena. But where does the wisdom come from? Where does the insight come from? Well, it also comes from meditation, too. And there are three forms of Buddhist wisdom that will allow us to end our suffering and help others end their suffering. They are, number one, impermanence. Number two, unsatisfactoriness. Number three, not self. Let's start with number one, impermanence. Everything is always changing. That's why everything is always the first time. The conditions necessary for me to be here today will never happen again in the way they did today. Can't. So every time I come here, it's always the first time. One of my favorite commercials of a couple years ago was from Corn Flakes. I never really liked Corn Flakes, but I liked the commercial. The commercial said, taste it again for the first time. I thought, how Buddhist is that? <laughs> that is so cool. So this impermanence keeps us alert. We can't trust it to be the same longer than a moment. Everything, ourselves, our appearance, our cars, our partners, our relationships, always in a constant state of flux and change, which requires us to check in. How are you doing? How am I doing? How's the situation doing? 
We can't take it for granted that it's going to stay this way any longer than a moment. It's a wake-up call. Number two, everything is ultimately unsatisfactory. Everything, ultimately, not always. Why is everything ultimately unsatisfactory in life? Because everything changes. And once you get attached to the way it is right now, you'll be disappointed with the way it's going to be in the next moment. When I look in the mirror now, I can't believe what looks back. What happened? All that impermanence. 16, 25, 35, 45, all those different stages of not looking too bad, not looking too good. They're right there in the mirror. And it's me. And I'm stuck. I can't stop it along the way. There's no place to stand where things don't change. So ultimately unsatisfactory. Don't get too attached to stuff the way they are right now. If it's bad stuff, you're going to be happy when it changes. If it's good stuff, you're going to be a little disappointed. But it's always going to change. Number three, not self. This is the most difficult concept for most people to understand when it comes to Buddhism because it says you are not who you think you are. You are a process. You are not an event. And I know you can look around and see your friends and family and know some of those people think they're an event. And it's okay. <laughs> but those people are simply a part of your process. We don't have an independent, unchanging quality according to Buddhism. And you can apply that any way you want. In the old days, they used to say soul. Now they say self. Then they said personality. But it's always a process, always becoming something else. We never achieve anything. We're always in a state of becoming something else. Wow. So what does that mean for wisdom? It means don't get too attached because it's changing. Don't get too attached because there's always going to be suffering connected to it, eventually. <clears throat> and don't get too attached to who you think you are because in the very next moment, you won't be that person any longer. I have had at least 25 memorial services for the people I used to be. <laughs> and some of the people I used to be, I sort of liked, you know? But they had to die so the next person could manifest and be something. And then that person had to die. So, that's, so I look at my life as sort of a relay race. We have a baton. And all those people I used to be just keep handing off the baton to the next person I'm going to be. And so there is, there, there is a connection between all the lives. In the same way if you light a candle with a candle, it's not the same flame but it's not a different flame either. So all those people I used to be are connected, and I am eager to see who's going to happen next. As I do my meditation and practice the five precepts and build my future with all my present moment experiences, my thoughts, my speech, and my action. Now in Buddhism, they say what migrates from lifetime to lifetime is not you, that's for sure. It's not your soul. There's a little discussion going on about that. What is the soul? What isn't the soul? But what migrates lifetime to lifetime is your karma, according to Buddhism. So everything you have thought, said, and done has created a certain energy, good energy or not so good energy, like the wake behind a boat. And at some point, that boat sinks. That's you. But your karma is the wake, and your karma then connects to the next boat, the next person you're going to be. And off it goes. And then that person in that boat gets to change the wake by what they think, say, and do. And then that wake connects to the next boat and the next boat. Somebody said, and I think wisely, but why should I care about the next person I'm going to be if I'm not going to be that person? And I have to say they're right. Why would you care about the next person you're going to be, even the next lifetime <coughs> you're going to be? Why? What is missing? What do you need? Well, you need altruism. 
You need to understand that we're all connected and we're all similar and dissimilar at the same time. And everything you do affects everything else and everything else affects you. And you're doing it for the next person because you're doing it now for yourself. You're practicing the five precepts, you're changing greed, hatred, and delusion into positive qualities, and all those things make your life better right now. <clears throat> and then at some point you might get this sort of bodhisattva ideal where I'm going to help all sentient beings by being the best person I can be. And whoever gets my karma, whoever gets my wake, will be so excited <clears throat> and so happy. And they won't even know where it came from. And so in feeding the cats, I don't get a thank you. In having a good life, I don't get a thank you for the next person who will accept my karma. But is it necessary? Is it something we're really working hard on doing? Or is it simply how we're living our life? Is it extraordinarily ordinary? And as it turns out, it is. It is. And if everybody just had that mindset, this world would be a beautiful place to live. But they don't, so we encourage them to practice. <laughs> Somebody on Facebook the other day said, you play all these instruments. I said, well, no, I don't play all these instruments. I practice all these instruments. <laughs> That's how life is. So be here now. Five precepts, meditation, Come to the present moment experience of your life, the wonderful present moment, and you will be building your future in a most skillful way. And I would like to end my talk today with a little blues harmonica, <laughs> because I know <clears throat> that sometimes people get depressed when they hear me speak. <laughs> so this is a way of making them feel better. The blues is designed to make a bad person feel better. <laughs> okay. So this is my new harmonica. This is uh, called the Big Six. <laughs> yeah, and I really like it because it has so many limitations. <laughs> you know? And limitations cause you to be creative. So I'm going to be creative. Thank <laughs> you.